Hi, my name's Tom, and today I'm going to show you how I turned this into all this. When I first moved here, every one of the fields that you see now was completely overgrown with trees and brush and buckthorn, uh, pokeweed, thistle, lamb's ear, uh, poison sumac, poison ivy. What a mess. A lot of work getting this old farm back into it somewhat operational status. The buildings were run down. The only part of the whole place that was actually mowed was about 10 feet in front of the house and about the same out back. The rest of it was completely overgrown with, with weeds and trees and brush. I was still in the military at the time in 2013 and uh, you, some of you may remember there was a government shutdown for about a month and so they told me to just stay home and I ultimately got paid but uh, it was an unexpected paid month vacation, which was perfect timing because I had just moved here and I used all that time to work on the property. My preferred way to bring back old pastures is with a bush hog or some sort of mowing machine or mowing device and just keep mowing down the brush and the thistle and the weeds. If you keep it mowed down, eventually the grasses come back. And even though most of the fields were really overgrown, there was still a substantial amount of native grasses here. There was a lot of timothy, oat grass, orchard grass, and particularly purple clover. So in order to encourage that to come back, I, I would just keep mowing and then wherever there was a viable stand of pasture grass that was native to the land, I would let that go to seed and propagate and keep eradicating the weeds. Eventually, by doing that, I was able to reseed a substantial amount of the pastures the natural way. Nature put the, the, the plants that I wanted to seed and I didn't mow them. The seeds spread themselves around and they propagated. And each subsequent year of being here, more and more of the old pastures started coming back into decent cropland. Another thing I did the very first summer I was here, or the spring, was I contacted the Soil Conservation Service and they came out and helped me do soil samples of all the different pastures that I wanted to establish. We packed those up and sent them off to the labs at the University of Maine in Orono. And after a couple weeks they came back and they told me what I needed to add to certain places and it was mostly lime, a little bit of, a little bit of nitrogen but mostly lime. So I, I started spreading all my manure and by, by then I had developed a pretty sizable herd of goats and sheep and a, and a few cows and a lot of poultry. So I was spreading all the manure that I had on all the fields, keeping them mowed down. And in places where the, the grass wasn't coming back the way I wanted it to, I pulled out my plow and my disc harrow and I started plowing the soil under and then disking it and reseeding a lot of that into the pasture that I wanted. When you're reseeding your pastures, it's very important that you buy seed that is naturalized or developed in the area of the country that you live in. You don't want to go get southern something or other and then plant it up here in Maine. It's just not going to it's not going to work out. It's the same way you're not going to take a northern heavy crop and then try to plant it down south south and expect good results from it. So we went to the local feed stores and got a lot of grass seed hay seed, pasture seed that was native to the area and started putting that down. I also bought some brassicas, some food plot feed or food plot seeds. Not that I was trying to establish a food plot, but I was like, well, if the deer like it and the turkeys like it, the cows and sheep are going to like it too. And, and that actually proved to be pretty true. A lot of that stuff came out a lot better than I thought it would. And I was really impressed. So year after year, I put more and more manure down. I disked and plowed up the areas that weren't coming back the way I wanted them to and I would sow seed. There's a lot of different ways that people will establish pasture. The favorite one is the one I just told you about mowing and mowing and mowing and then wherever you're not getting satisfactory results to plow that up and, and plant down what you want. Some folks will swear by frost seeding but I could never get the timing right and it was seemed like a waste of money. 
I also tried overseeding and not too much of that actually took hold. So that was a waste. I would even overseed and then take a spike aerator and try to drive it into the soil. And that didn't work really well either. So it seemed like as you know, some people could get away with doing it with, with good results, but it didn't work out. When I moved, I brought a pretty good sized flock of chickens and a couple of geese and ducks along with me. And then the very next year, I brought some sheep in. And along with the sheep, I started rebuilding the old fences. Some of them I could stand back up temporarily and put a new post here and there. But for the most part, by and large, I had to rebuild all the fences and all the paddocks. And so I started pretty much with this one here that you see, the one off to the left and the one off to the right. So the first year, this is what I had. This was completely overgrown. I thought it was a Christmas tree farm at first because there were so many scrub pines in here. One lesson I learned pretty early on was not to overgraze, you establish rotational grazing. And the only way to do that on this spread was to get permanent fencing around all the old pastures. I've, I've showed you this in a lot of videos, how I've got tons and tons of individual small pastures, so throw net and the moving the electric fence, all those things really wasn't a viable solution here. So I had to build permanent fences around each pasture and then sometimes I would take a, a strand of electric wire and make alleys to get through one pasture to the other but by and large all my pastures are permanent fences. So overgrazing you have to you have to keep an eye on your land and, and it's a it's a kind of a science about how long you keep your animals on a certain spot. If you only keep them there a very brief time, they eat all the, the tasty stuff and they leave the less tasty stuff behind. If you leave them there too long, then they eat all the stuff to a nub. And if they're hungry enough, they might eat, actually, actually eat some toxic weeds. So probably three or four days on each pasture here is about the max that I can sustain. Additionally, you don't want to put your animals on it too soon. So let's say you planted a new pasture. You don't want to put your animals on it as soon as the grass comes up. You need to let that grass come up and establish itself and compete with the weeds a little bit. And then you can come back through and deal with the weeds or bare spots. That also plays into, in the spring, don't let your animals out as soon as the grass turns green because they'll tear it up. And if they are grazing, the pasture down to a nub as soon as they're let out in the spring the grass never has a chance to come come up and mature so what you really want is plant diversity you don't want to plant just one type of grass over everything because it's kind of like the difference between a you know a bowl of iceberg lettuce chopped up and a, you know a nice healthy salad you want different types of grasses and so the animals will graze on different grasses and get different nutrients out of all of them. One, one thing I really like to plant a lot is legumes and clover is one of those because clover is nitrogen fixing. So it puts nitrogen back in the soil whereas the other grasses take nitrogen out. So one of the things that I do too is I, I combination mow and graze the fields. I'll, I'll put the animals out there, they'll graze it for a little bit and if some of the grass gets ahead of them I'll cut it but I don't cut all of it and the reason I don't cut all of it is one I want that grass, the grasses that I like to go to seed and, and propagate themselves but also you've got some wildflowers and a lot of different grasses that will encourage uh, beneficial insects like butterflies and honeybees and the tall grass will shelter some moles and voles and rabbits 
which will bring in the coyotes and the foxes. But if you have chickens or poultry, you're going to have foxes and coyotes anyway. So better to have the foxes and coyotes go chase the moles and voles and, and bunnies out there than to come after your chickens. So by having your animals out there, they're mowing the field for you, which is a labor saver to say the least, and they're also fertilizing it as, as they're going out there. Some people will come behind with chickens to spread the cow patties out, but I, I haven't had good luck with that moving you know, the Conestoga wagon chicken buildings all over the place. It's so labor intensive that uh, I just don't have time for that by myself. But I have found that different species will eat different things. So if you put sheep and cows and goats out together, well, the goats are primarily browsers. So they'll get a lot of the bushes and stuff that the cows don't want, and the cows and sheep will get stuff that the other species don't want. And by and large, having more than one species out there, they will pretty much eat all the, all the stuff equally. In different areas, I planted wildflowers because they're pretty, uh, but it also adds a lot of aesthetics to your fields and your pastures to have wildflowers out there as well. You can pick fresh bouquets for your wife or whatever, but it just, uh, it really makes it a lot more serene. I've dug some ponds so the animals have different places to get water. One of the, one of the biggest things that I, I found when I had all these different paddocks was how many get water to all these animals. In the first few years I was hauling water tanks and filling water troughs and dumping and scrubbing. Water troughs, believe it or not, they even if you scrub and clean them, they've always got some kind of bacteria in there. And once I did away with water troughs and went to water cups only, so the cows have fresh water or the sheep have fresh water on demand, my instances of coccidia have all but gone away. And the, the, the animals don't get any bugs, they don't get anything. And so I think, I think that stagnant water even, I even tried like an aerator, I tried a bunch of stuff. Um, some people said put these oat bricks in there, uh, a little bit of chlorine in there, all different things, but I, I just couldn't combat the problem. So I've got uh, the brooks, I've got the, the farm ponds, and I've got the, the, the paddle drinkers. And so I've just found that the fresh water on demand has really been a game changer for the animals. And so people that trucking water and moving chicken houses all over the place. It's just so labor intensive. Moving those those electro net, the sheep nets. I'm one guy, I just don't have time to go out there every day and, and move fences, move chickens, haul water, and then you know all the things that are broken and need to be fixed as at the same time. So these are just some labor saving tips that I've I've learned over the over the process of being here. I've also found that I, by leaving some of the grass to grow, the dragonflies have come in. They've eradicated a lot of the mosquitoes, the ladybugs. I don't have a lot of problem with uh, the fruits and vegetables. I do spray a little bit here and there, but uh, by and large, I don't have issues either with disease or bugs or invasive plants. Hopefully this video has been helpful to you. Please take a moment and like the video. I'd also be honored if you'd subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so that you don't miss any future videos. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.